Bob Herbert's op-ed.tv is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation with the support of Ann Ulnick. Hi, I'm Bob Herbert. Welcome to Op-Ed.TV. It's been more than 40 years since that famous Daily News headline, Ford to City, Drop Dead, hammered home the severity of the New York fiscal crisis. The city in those days would be virtually unrecognizable to current residents who never experienced that troubled time. A new book, Fear City, New York's Fiscal Crisis and the Rise of Austerity Politics, revisits that era, analyzes it, and shows how profoundly it shaped today's New York. My guest is the author of that book, Kim Phillips Fine, a teacher of history at NYU's Gallatin School of Individualized Study. Welcome. Thanks for coming in. I appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me on. Describe, let's go back to even before the beginning. <laughs> yes. Uh, describe the political and economic environment um, nationally and locally that led up to the fiscal crisis in New York City. Right. Well, the, a, there are many famous images of New York in the 1970s coming to us from films like Taxi Driver or Panic in Needle Park, which paint the city as a kind of you know, apocalyptic scene of urban despair. And there is a certain kind of truth to this. I think one of the stories that I open the book with is a description of the collapse, the literal collapse, of the West Side Highway in the winter of 1973. The highway was in need of repair and a truck filled with asphalt was driving across it to start the repairs. It couldn't hold up and the subway, it just, it just collapsed, falling down, tearing a huge hole in the this highway. It was an elevated highway. Yeah, it was an elevated highway mm -hmm. downtown then. Um, another story that I tell in the book is uh, the rat population of Central Park <laughs> was, was, was exploding in early 1975, even as the park's workers uh, were being laid off. So the city was a, it, indeed a, a, a troubled place in the early 1970s. This is an era of the, you know, the, the, the United States has just been defeated in Vietnam. President Nixon has just left office. Right. The, there is a kind of a, a sense, I think, of anxiety and, um, and, and fear about the future, not just of America's cities, but the country as a whole. In the early 1970s, New York was in trouble. But I think the fiscal crisis actually, in some ways, has its roots uh, someplace in, in a different place than, than that kind of image of it's urban trouble, poverty. Right? Yeah. And I think to, to really understand, I think one thing that, that I try to do in the book is give a sense of the way that New York in the post-war years, in the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, the way that that city was also very different from the New York of today. The conventional wisdom is that in this economic environment in which, as you point out nationally, there were a lot of, there were a lot of problems uh, going on, the conventional wisdom is that New York was done in by these liberal politicians who wanted to provide all these, um, what they thought of as excessive services, mm -hmm. the welfare uh, benefits, uh, free college tuition, a network of uh, municipal hospitals, and on and on and on, that these liberals wanted to provide all these service, services without having the money to pay for them, which meant that a crisis of some sort was inevitable. Right. Was there any truth to that? A lot of truth, no truth. What was the reality? Right, well, the way I see it is, so if you look at New York today, New York, contemporary New York is one of the most unequal cities in a country that is becoming ever more economically unequal. It's a city where upwards of 60,000 people sleep in homeless shelters each night, uh, and, and yet, at the same time, large parts of the city are becoming kind of, you know, parking places for the wealth of a global elite. And New York in the post-war years was not really like this, partly because 
of a long-standing tradition of generous funding for social services, one that goes back to the 19th century in some ways, but really expands during the New Deal and in the post-war years. There was, as you mentioned, a, that, you know, a, a network of more than 20 at the peak municipal hospitals. There were public health clinics throughout the five boroughs. There was free college tuition at the city's public university, um, which was itself growing during this period. There was the, the transit system was you know low cost in a way that is just not right. the case today. Um, there's a kind of public investment in art and culture in the city. So the city has a and, and this comes from a long-standing traditions of social activism in New York, the strength of the city's labor movement, the strength and vibrancy of its left-wing politics and also the, the unique relationship the city has with the federal government, especially during the LaGuardia years in the 1930s, which kind of starts a new wave of public investment. So there's a much stronger investment in social services in the city. And I think one of the aspects of this book, uh, which is a little different from the conventional wisdom, is that I think that many New Yorkers view those services as vital, important, critical parts of life, not just sort of frivolous, you know, irrelevant, right. foolish kinds of spending, but that they actually represented something important, a certain kind of investment, a public investment in a different kind of urban space and a, a democratic political and social culture in the city. And they, you know, they expand in the 1960s during the war on poverty years. Um, there is a, a growth in, in, for example, daycare centers that are, are receive funding, uh, subsidized daycares um, for low income and working class women uh, and families. There is a growth in drug treatment facilities. There is, of course, the beginning of Medicaid and the expansion of welfare. All of this is also in response to intense social protest in the city, the organization of, um, of, of women on welfare and the welfare rights movement, the Black Panthers, the Young Lords, the growth of the city's public sector labor movement, also inspired in part by the civil rights and black freedom movements. So there's a kind of a, a social ferment in the city, which is leading to the expansion of spending and I, I don't view, I guess I guess that's one key thing so I don't view that as irresponsible on the part of the city government in and of itself for kind of foolish or irrelevant spending it was it was actually trying to address real social needs so you had these services right which the the public embraced I mean yes. they really and they really needed them I mean mm -hmm. there was a real um, uh, need for uh, many if not most right. of these services but the question but hovering over to, the city yes. then mm -hmm. was whether they were affordable absolutely and you go into great detail on uh, three mayors um, right especially uh, at the beginning yes uh, Wagner before the uh, mm -hmm. fiscal crisis crisis uh, John Lindsay and Abe Bean, yes. um, and they, they, there was a fair amount of fiscal chicanery going on yes, at there, that time. Yes, there certainly was. So, so talk about them a little bit. Right, so one of the, the, the um, you know, in a way, the expansion of this public sector, especially during the 1960s, it was, a, there was, it was a kind of real political question about how to do this, who would pay for it. The city's elite is getting increasingly, there, there's a lot of criticism and anxiety about, about the, the growth of social services. At one point, for example, the, the stock exchange, the leaders of the New York Stock Exchange threatened to leave the city altogether to go and take the New York Stock Exchange up to Stamford, Connecticut, <laughs> or maybe even Eureka, California. <laughs> so there's a, a, after a new tax is, is, is proposed and passed, uh, a tax on stock transfers. Which we need now, by the way. But right, which we can bring it back, story. but it was, it was scrapped later <laughs> on. But at that point, it, it existed. And so there was a, you know, there was an increasing sense about how will this be funded? And, and in a way, I think, I think in a way that, you know, the Lindsay especially is able to take advantage of a big increase in federal funds later in the 1960s during the kind of high point of the war on poverty. But in a sense, you know, the, the basic funding problems the city has, I think, are, are the relationship between the city, the state, and the federal government. Cities are not able to tax income as aggressively as these higher levels of government. They do rely on transfers back. In addition, the city at this point, you know, people are leaving for the surrounding suburbs. In a way, there's a pro the city generates all this wealth, but much of that wealth is taken out of the city into the surrounding the, the suburbs of Westchester and northern New Jersey. 
the city has no access, no real way to recapture that wealth. And instead of taking on the kind of political fight that might have been needed to challenge these basic funding problems, what the mayors do is uh, use debt, start to use debt to kind of push these conflicts off to the future. They borrowed the money yes. they needed and to run way, the city from day to day. Right. And in a way, I think that's where the real irresponsibility lies. It wasn't so much in the spending per se, but it was the decision to not view it as a serious political question and to kind of engage in the fights that might have been necessary to build the support for this, both within the city and also in a kind of larger political sense. So they, they start to borrow, and I think it's not just the, they start to borrow heavily in terms of short-term debt in particular. And here too, it's not just the city, the whole, you know, the banks, you know, the city's banks are perfectly happy to market this debt right. and to underwrite it. The rating agencies give the city's bonds strong ratings. There's a sense that, you know, what could go wrong? It's New York. How could it fail? So there's a the, the financial community also plays a very important role in the buildup of short-term debt that ultimately is what results in the fiscal crisis. So um, the day of reckoning occurs uh, in, essentially in 1975. Yeah, in 1975. And that's where the headline comes from. They were looking right. for loan guarantees or some kind of substantial help from the federal right. government. Gerald Ford yes. is president. Yes. And, and Ford turns them down. Right. Uh, I think it's interesting there were, were people like... Uh, 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 Greenspan and right. Donald Rumsfeld yes. and, and others uh, arguing against aid, yes. uh, Alan Greenspan arguing against aid um, to the city. Right. Uh, and for a while, their view prevailed. Yeah. Ford turns them down, hence the headline, Drop Dead. Right. Uh, but eventually, the city was not allowed to go bankrupt, to right. default on its obligations. Yes. Why was that, and how was bankruptcy avoided? Right. Well, Ford was Ford was himself, and as you, as you point out, many of his advisors, um, and I, I would also mention, in addition to oh, Alan Greenspan, yeah, William Simon, who was his Treasury Secretary, Donald Rumsfeld, Chief of Staff, and then Alan Greenspan, who was the Chair of the Council of Economic Advisors. He was kind of fresh from the inner circles of uh, objectivist philosopher Ayn Rand <laughs> and her sense of kind of the value, the virtues of selfishness. So, he, you know, these, these, this circle of advisors was very opposed to aiding New York. They thought that doing so meant lending political support to the city's social welfare state. And they, they were very reluctant to do so. They also, they, they had a kind of, I would have to call it kind of a gleeful sense of almost flirting with disaster or they were they were well, they were conservatives right. and new york in trouble to them meant that that whole liberal notion that whole liberal ideology was a failure right it was a sign of the failure of the new deal and of the great society so they really seize on this but there's also a broad swath of uh, the kind of political elite in the city around the country in congress even internationally um, which views the bankruptcy of new york as a political disaster. I mean, they, they, they think that it's going to, it will, it will kind of hurt the image of the U.S. internationally, it will hurt the United States in the Cold War, it will potentially damage the economy more generally. If New York goes bankrupt, well, how it, will, it may affect New York State, it will affect municipal bond markets across the whole country. Um, there's a strong sense that you know, it actually is dangerous to simply allow this to go bankrupt. And I think, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty at the time. There was no law that really governed the bankruptcy of a city as large and complex as New right. York. No one really knew what would happen. How A city is not, after all, like a corporation. It can't just fold up shop. It has to keep providing police service, fire right. service. There was a question, there was a debate, would the schools be viewed as an emergency service that could keep running even in bankruptcy, or would the schools have to shut down? Yeah, so, you, and, and what happens in a city right. of 8 million if you shut down uh, the schools? What, exactly. You know, uh, anyway, but, yeah, there was a, a strong fear of the potential for you know, really intense social unrest. And I think that is part of what leads, so, so what ultimately happens is that the, the, the city and the state uh, they, they pass a, state, a set of, um, of both some tax increases, and, but also agreeing to a set of very steep budget cuts for the city. And, and, they also, and, and when they do this, they are able to then get 
uh, the, 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 some of the banks come forward and buy debt. So too do the city's unions. And you did have federal guarantees. Yeah, and then ultimately, well, the, uh, first you have the, and the federal government steps in with a series of short-term loans, which are very important in terms of getting the banks and the unions to agree to purchase um, the city obligations once again. And to, to do this, I mean, I, I should also say this, this, that new state agencies were created that took control to a large measure of the city's budget. Big Mac. Yes, Big Mac, <laughs> uh, which sold bonds to refinance the city's debt. That was the Municipal Assistance municipal Corporation. Municipal Assistance Corporation, yeah. and then the Emergency Financial Control Board, which is a state agency staffed by, which had, it had seven voting members. Um, the mayor and the comptroller of the city were two of them, but then the other five were uh, the governor and the state comptroller, I believe, and then three people from the private sector. Right. So it was a way, and people at the time, you know, labor asked for a seat on the Emergency Financial Control Board. Also, there were, you know, the community groups, African American and Latino state politicians asked that there be somebody representing those communities in the city. There was really no interest in that. That went nowhere. <laughs> and it was, so, so in a way, and the Emergency Financial Control Board gained a kind of final veto power, really, over the city's budget, trying to make sure that it was you know, making progress towards uh, a balanced budget once again. And the view was to, it wasn't just the view, it was the reality, to insist on these steep, even draconian yeah. budget cuts. And those cuts went into effect. Right. Talk about what that did to the daily life of New Yorkers. Right. So there were very intense uh, budget cuts. So the, the police force was cut by the, um, a little bit less than a quarter. The, the uh, fire department employees declined by about 17 percent. Sanitation workers declined by a little less than 20 percent. People working for the Board of Education it declines by a bit less than 15 percent. And these cuts take place over a very short time period of uh, about three years or so. Uh, and they're also, and they're, they they take place, you know, in a city where there's a rising crime rate, in which you know the the Bronx and Brooklyn have these fire waves. Um, a city in which poverty is climbing, climbing from about 14 percent in the late 60s to a little over 20 percent in the early 80s. The school system was already struggling. The school system was already struggling deeply. It's a, it's a city in which there is a kind of intense level of social need, and in a way, these cuts kind of just fly, which are enacted in a very haphazard way, they, they fly in the face of that. And so you have, you know, you, you have the school day shrinking, um, the, you know, the, the loss of all the school crossing guards in the city, you have the loss of many of the extracurricular activities, art and music in the schools. Um, you, so you have the city, I think, becoming in some way, the, those images that I spoke of at the beginning of, of, the, of the sort of, you know, the dangerous city, of the, the 70s, you know, in part, that's generated by the politics of the fiscal crisis and the, the kind of withdrawal of social resources at the very moment when they were most needed. The technocrats, the, the, the bankers and, and others who had gained such control over um, what otherwise should have been political decisions mm -hmm. in the city, their idea was the budget has to be balanced make these cuts, you don't have enough money to pay for these services, right. end of story. So they didn't yeah. really look at the human need um, that was in, involved in all of this. One of the key points of your book was that it didn't have to be that way. Right. Talk a little bit about that. At the time, these cuts were met with intense social protests. So one of the central things that actually President Ford really focuses on is the, uh, the, the sense of needing to, to start having tuition at CUNY um, and also there's a, a plan to consolidate many of the CUNY campuses, for example, Hostos Community College in the South Bronx. Um, and there are, you know, kind of intense protests there, people asking that it remain open. Um, there's a, 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 a firehouse in Brooklyn that's threatened with closure and people sleep in it for 16 months and use it as kind of a base for neighborhood activism. It actually is kept open in the end. So there's a kind of a, a, a protest movement in the city of people, you know, insisting that these cuts are not, you know, are, are not the way to go. I think that the, you know, the broader question, how could New York have gotten out of the fiscal crisis without this program of cuts, 
at the end of the day, I think that it, this really is, it, it required a, a broader framework for thinking about the crisis. And that part of the dynamic of a fiscal crisis is that all the larger questions about, about social responsibility, about political obligations, about what we might owe to each other, about what the broader fabric of the political culture is going to be, about the reasons, the underlying reasons for a kind of revenue shortfall, these all get swept to the side as there, there comes to be this kind of insistence on cuts above all else. And so I think, you know, the, to really address the problems of the fiscal crisis would have required, you know, a set of things that really, that, were, that weren't altogether on the political agenda <laughs> at that time. But it's not that they were, you know, the things like rethinking the funding formulas for Medicaid, things like rethinking the way that the federal government and the state interacted with the city overall, rethinking tax structures more broadly. Which um, would have required cooperation from the city, the state, state and, and the, the federal, federal government. Yes, all of these these solutions, these were not really part of the political conversation, but I think that's actually where the problem lies, that once you have the dynamic of a crisis in this way, the larger questions about the cause of the problem and the potential solutions are just written out of discussion altogether. We've only got a couple of minutes left, but the elites, who by definition yes. are doing well, and you, you mentioned the inequality in the city, but the elites would say, New York is a, a much better place right. now. There's, there's yes. uh, much less um, crime. Uh, the economy is much stronger mm -hmm. than it was. Um, you know, and of course, you right. know, the city was on the verge of uh, bankruptcy. They would say that the school system is in better shape, even though there are still uh, problems. Uh, it, so they would say, look, this was tough medicine, right. but it was something that we had to do right. to get to a better place. Right. How would you respond to that? Well, I guess I would say I guess I would I would say two things. First is I think the things look different today than they did in the 1980s and early 1990s. And New York's kind of emergence from the problems of the fiscal crisis area is slow. It doesn't take place in any kind of there's no quick turnaround. But then more deeply, I think you have to ask the changes and improvements in the city are there for some, but not for everybody. This is just remain right. and, and the, the inequality in the city uh, and the changes in the city's policies are, you know, have, have, I think, a devastating effect on poor and working class communities in the city and more broadly on the kind of ability of the city to really sustain a middle class at all. And so I, I think, it, you know, New York may be better for some people, but I think is it really better for everybody? That's the question I would ask. And I think, you know, there's also a part of the book where I talk a bit about um, changes in the city's policies, especially, you know, the, the effort to use the public sector to, uh, you know, instead of, of, of social services, to gear public spending more towards appealing to developers and corporate elites. And I, I tell a little bit about the story of Donald Trump's entrance into Manhattan real estate through the development of the Commodore Hotel near Grand Central Terminal. Uh, long story short, this was sort of Trump was a, a young man then in his late 20s and was mostly known as the son of an outer borough developer and got into Manhattan real estate through this deal whereby he, he working with the Hyatt Corporation, was able to attain a, a you know, remarkable property tax break um, worth upward of $350 million as of last year, according to the Times. And it is... Uh, you know, this was was actually trumpeted at the time as evidence to the broader business community that New York had changed its ways and changed, you know, it was a change in its business climate. And so I think, you know, the question is, are deals like that, are those really worth it for the city? Do they actually deliver the good jobs and the kind of movement towards social equality that would really make New York a city available to all? Well, we're going to have to leave it uh, right there. We're leaving it with a question, which I'd like to uh, answer maybe on another yes. time. Uh, thank you so much, Kim Phillips. Fine. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, we'll be back in a moment with a final word. Donald Trump has repeatedly crowed that he wants to enact the largest tax cuts in American history. We know that those tax cuts would go primarily to the very wealthiest members of our society. 
And we now know that Trump plans to pay for those tax cuts with the largest cuts to programs for the most vulnerable people in America that we've ever seen. The president's newly unveiled budget is worse than devastating. It is cruel and immoral. The better part of a trillion dollars would be cut from Medicaid, the federal health program that is literally a lifeline for the poor. If enacted, those cuts will cause untold physical and mental suffering and countless deaths. We should ask ourselves, how many poor people is it okay to sacrifice to pump additional billions into the accounts of people who already have more money than they can ever spend? Donald Trump's budget would also cut the food stamps program by nearly $200 billion, causing, among others, poor children to go hungry. It would even slash Meals on Wheels, which provides desperately needed food for older, often very fragile Americans while giving tax cuts, remember, to the very rich. There's more. Pell Grants and subsidized student loans, which help poorer students get a college education, would be cut. Benefits for the disabled would be cut. So would spending for environmental protection, scientific research, the arts, and on and on. This is a budget that makes Marie Antoinette seem like a philanthropist. We already have the worst wealth and income inequality in the United States since the Gilded Age. But this budget tells us that no amount of wealth is enough for the likes of Trump, and that there is virtually no limit to the suffering among the poor and the vulnerable that this president is willing to offer up to feed the endless greed of those at the top of our economic pyramid. That's all for now. See you next time.